Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's ceremony, commissioning Kevin Deese as an ensign in the United States Navy Reserve. I am Lieutenant Kyle Coya. Direct Commission Officer Recruiter, Navy Reserve Town Acquisition Group Northeast, Site Pittsburgh. And I will be serving as Master of Ceremony this afternoon. At this time, please rise as you are able for arrival of the official party and remain standing for the singing of the Star Spangled Banner by the Buffalo Gay Men's Chorus under the direction of Dr. Robert Strauss and the invocation by Father Vincent. Let us pray. Almighty and all powerful God, we thank you for this pleasant afternoon that we can stand before you with Kevin Deeds on a special and memorable day, in a very special way with his family and friends. At this time, we invoke your divine presence upon to be commissioned Kevin Deeds as an ensign in the United States Navy Reserve and also upon all those who are gathered here in person and in thoughts. We ask that you accompany Kevin Dees and all of us throughout this commissioning ceremony, where we have sincerely gathered to honor and respect the hard work and dedication, the authenticity and integrity, the sacrifice and love of peace for our nation's Navy. We ask that you continue to inspire him today and every day. Lord, we ask that you open our hearts and minds to cherish this joyful commissioning celebration and be inspired by Kevin Dee's life and faith. Lord, we ask you that for Kevin, not only this ceremony is a clear sign of excellence, but also shall be the beginning of great adventure and excellence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So Mr. Dees has uh, kindly asked for me to be your master of ceremony today and to deliver some uh, opening remarks. Uh, so here goes that. It is with honor, excitement, and gratitude that Ensign Select Dees has asked me to be the MC for today's historically significant event. It seems like it was close to a year ago now, I received a call from Chief Sabrino, soon to be a retired Chief Sabrino. Chief called me saying, hey LT, I have a special referral for you. I sighed. I said, special is usually code for someone trying to sweep their way into the Navy Reserve wardroom by calling in favors or shopping for recruiters. Needless to say, I typically dread those kind of calls and referrals knowing it's probably not gonna pan out. Indeed, a call unlike anything I could have possibly imagined. I spoke with Kevin, he passed my rigorous blueprint and screening, and I was trying to connect the dots, how someone so smart, successful, graduated from the Naval Academy, didn't end up commissioning. Kevin spilled the beans, and I knew this was indeed a special case, one requiring my utmost attention precision and care. As the calls started coming in from several entities, 
Judge Advocate Generals, JAGs, officials at the level of Secretary of Defense, I knew this was serious. I was instructed to treat him like any other candidate. So I did, despite wanting to give him my red carpet treatment. Kevin passed every nuanced test of character, attention to detail, the time management challenges, and more that I throw at my, my candidates typically. At the time in my applicant pool of over 70 active candidates, Kevin was a top choice overall from the eyes of this recruiter. His motivation, transcripts, corporate success, and his tremendous character proved worthy of the Navy Reserve Award Room and ultimately the Supply Corps. Needless to say, his candidacy proved successful. Kevin is a true product of the Naval Academy and his closest loved ones, friends, and classmates at the Academy should understand that Kevin earned his commission not once, but twice. Chief Sabrina for taking Kevin through the MEPS process and seeing it through, and to everyone in the crowd and beyond for shaping Kevin into the officer who will appear before you today. Let the show go on. Retired U.S. Navy Vice Admiral Kevin Green, sir, you're invited to the stage to deliver your keynote remarks. Thank you all being with us today to participate in acknowledging the commitment to service of Ensign Kevin Deeds, United States Navy. I have enormous personal regard and respect for the Naval Reserve. I have enormous personal respect and regard for the Supply Corps. It's one Navy. He will be a Naval officer on commissioning, which is going to happen shortly. It's been a long and arduous road, and today he stands ready to defend the nation as a serving officer, fully deployable, qualified to carry out the duties entrusted to him in defense of our nation, and to lead the magnificent men and women who will look to him with confidence and faith in his abilities, in his courage, and in his integrity, as do I. This is a great day for America and for our Navy. It's been a long time in coming, as you all know, and only Kevin's strength of character and stamina brought us here today. He resolved to serve, and so shall he. of devotion to duty, and I'm very proud to be here today to be part of this. So he's joining the Navy again. What does the Navy do today? Four big things. Strategic deterrence. Deterring strategic attack against our homeland and our allies and our interests around the world. Sea control. Keeping the sea lanes open. 90% products that come to the United States come by sea. If we don't defend the global commons, we're not doing our job. The Navy does that. Projecting power ashore, prevailing in conflict anywhere, and naval presence, giving us the ability to exercise initiative anywhere in the globe. So in other words, preserving the peace, responding in crisis, and winning decisively in the war. So what? It's a nice, big, friendly world, isn't it? If you read and you listen and you think, you realize between Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, terrorism, criminality around the globe, naval national defense dictates the Navy's role. Our adversaries aim to overcome our strengths. One of the biggest ones, and this is one that Kevin will be personally engaged in, is called contested logistics, stopping us from being able to provide 
the things that our former fleet requires to operate and to win in battle. So what now? The Navy's focused on war fighting and war fighters. Kevin will be focused on war fighting and on war fighters. He'll be involved in prioritizing readiness and capabilities and capacity to sustain the fight forward. He'll be investing in disruptive technology to improve our capabilities and our reach. He'll be involved in investing, investing in the defense industrial base, the shipyards, the munitions, and the products that make a Navy. In sum, thinking about those missions and what it takes to bring them about. It's not just about tactics, it's about being ready, resilient, and persistent. And logistics are extremely important and immersed in all of this. And that's where Kevin's gonna make his mark. In helping ensure that our fleet, our sailors, and our partner warfighters have what they need to carry out those missions, he will help run the Navy's business as a business. And I know he'll be brilliant at it. Let's start briefly with his oath of office, which he's going to go through in a minute, administered by his older brother. The core of it is simply this. He's going to swear that he will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. There's a lot more to it, you'll hear it in a few minutes, but it is clear that there are a lot of people in public life who don't understand what defending the Constitution means. This man, this officer does, and I look forward to watching him do it. What's it all mean? You put all this stuff together, the expectations we have on him. One of our greatest naval heroes back during the Revolution and beyond, a fellow named John Paul Jones, you may have heard of him, had a lot of thoughts about what makes a naval officer. Lots been written about that. What he said in a nutshell is simply this. It is by no means enough that officers of the Navy should be capable mariners. They must be that, of course, but also a great deal more. They should be as well leaders of liberal education, refined manners, punctilious courtesy, and the nicest sense of personal honor. They should be the soul of tact, patience, justice, firmness, kindness, and charity. And he goes on well beyond that. Now, what I've just read to you, is that not precisely the person we all know Kevin to be? Is he not precisely the kind of person of whom we should trust our nation's security? I know he is just that person. Ladies and gentlemen, I now pass the con to Commander Adam Abbott Bull will administer the oath of office. Thank you. Adam will be here. For audience members who are not uniformed military personnel, please remain seated for the oath of office. Touch no. Raise your right hand if you have to be. I state your name. I am the East. You solemnly swear, you solemnly swear, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion, that I will well and faithfully, that I will well and faithfully, Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties of the office upon which I'm about to enter. Of the office upon which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. shoulder boards will now be affixed by parents Bob and Sue Deese. The pinning of rank is traditionally performed by the people most responsible for supporting the new officer in their journey to arrive at commissioning.
the officer's cover will now be placed by U.S. Army National Guard First Lieutenant Nicholas Harrison. The placement of the cover is traditionally reserved for an individual who has served as a mentor to this new officer. Chief Petty Officer Samuel Sabrina will now render the first salute. The first salute is an old tradition for all U.S. service branches in which newly commissioned officers give a silver dollar to the person from whom they receive the very first salute of their career. While no one knows for sure where this tradition originated, some suggest that it was passed on from British regiments garrisoning the U.S. during the colonial era. New officers were assigned an enlisted advisor who showed them the ropes, taught them their regimental history, as well as the ins and outs of the military profession. Lieutenants compensated their enlisted advisor with a small amount of money. American second lieutenants in the early 1800s received about $25 monthly as a base pay, a rations allowance of about $3, and an additional allowance of $1 for their enlisted advisor. While the advisor's pay was eventually discontinued, the relationship for mentoring the newly commissioned officer continued. This relationship is thought to be the basis for this tradition. By tradition, a dollar coin is the only coin given in exchange for this first salute. While the coin may be just one dollar in denomination, it represents a value far greater. To new officers, it may represent the respect found in one's newly earned rank and position. A twist on the thinking for the silver dollar salute is that the new officer must buy his first salute, as he has not yet, by the nature of his commission alone, earned it. <laughs> Gentlemen, I am proud to present the United States Navy Reserve's newest commission officer, Ensign Kevin Deese. watching on Facebook Live, hi. Uh, the fact that you took any time at all, let alone uh, that some set aside days and went on plane flights to be here today is, is deeply moving to me. Thank you to each and every one of you. Um, I apologize in advance for how long I'm about to speak. Uh, <laughs> getting here took more than 10 years, uh, and with that comes a lot of uh, reflecting. So I have some thoughts to share on the personal side of this journey, the community that helped me get here, and finally, some reflections on what I hope today can mean for all of us moving forward. I'd like to start by thanking the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park for providing this picture-perfect venue for, for today's ceremony. Uh, the Naval Park is a cultural treasure that we in Buffalo are blessed to have right here at our waterfront. For those who are local, I encourage you to check out their website and see the events plan for Memorial Day weekend. It's one of the times when this park shines the brightest. Uh, you may also consider making a donation to help keep the park thriving for years to come. You, you know, I was curious about the history of this ship we're on, the USS Little Rock. So I did some light research on the Naval Park's website and other sources. Okay, sure, Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> and when I tell you that this is the perfect venue, I'm really not exaggerating. The Little Rock was 
part of the Cleveland class of light cruisers built to help the Allies win World War II. However, she was commissioned too late to see combat duty in that war. Uh, to which I say, I feel your girl. <laughs> <laughs> good friend, Lil Rock, later. Uh, I have to admit, I'm a bit self-conscious about the scale of today's celebration. Most commissioning ceremonies of this nature, from civilian to reserve officer, tend to be intimate affairs without such fanfare and hoopla. I can't help but think of a line from my favorite movie, Steel Magnolias, an ounce of pretension is worth a pound of manure. <laughs> and that was for those wondering, who were wondering whether this ceremony could get any gayer. <laughs> always be here. But on the other hand, when something takes more than 10 years to make happen, uh, you know that one person could not have done it alone. And indeed, it has taken a village to get here. So it felt important to me to have a ceremony that did its best to honor that journey in that village. And as I have been reminded many times, today is about more than just me. Uh, more uni universally, it's about the triumph of perseverance, dedication to service, and equal treatment of all. I want to come back to this broader story, what I hope we can all take away from today, but I'd like to first reflect on the personal journey and broaden out from there. So yes, this occasion is at a larger scale than I might be totally comfortable with, but if I'm being honest, uh, if it had been up to me, this is not how I would have originally chosen to mark this milestone, or for that matter, when I would have chosen to commission. Uh, 10 years and one day ago, I stayed seated while my classmates stood to take the oath of office. Uh, first the new Marine Corps officers, and then the new Naval officers. When my name was called to go on stage, I walked off it with only uh, one piece of paper in this folio, my, uh, my diploma. While the rest of my classmates uh, thank you, walked off with not only their diploma, but their commission as well. Finally, during the famous hat toss, I made sure to not throw my midshipman cover up too high in the air as there was no officer cover waiting for me with my family. And I didn't want to be without a cover and out of uniform regulations the rest of the day. So it, it was a tough day, and one that I had to wear a smile for, because as my family reminded me, it was still a great accomplishment to make it through four years at the Naval Academy and graduate from such an esteemed institution. Still, I wanted to be anywhere but there that day. But as tough as that day, and many more have been since then, the journey's brought us to today. When I could finally raise my right hand in front of more than 100 of my closest friends and family, my village, in my home of Buffalo, to swear to protect and defend the Constitution as an officer in the Navy. And with the benefit of hindsight, coupled with a lifelong faith that has endured even through these last 10 years, that everything happens for a reason, I would not have had it any other way. Uh, do me a favor. Take a look at the baby-faced 22-year-old on your programs. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, uh, but I'm not sure that kid was really ready at that age to go out into the fleet and lead submariners. To be frank, I'm not sure any 22-year-old can really be ready for such an enormous responsibility. And sure, I probably would have figured it out, like most do, but I think I also might have made some big mistakes along the way. And that's because I don't think I really knew myself very well at that age. I had spent, at that point, 85% of my life denying something as basic as the type of individuals I felt attracted to. And that fundamental of uncertainty and insecurity around uh, the most basic facts of one's life makes it very hard to trust one's own instincts and judgment. I'm glad I've had the past 10 years to grow and learn about myself and my values. It certainly doesn't make me immune from making mistakes moving forward, but I sure do like my chances better now, with, without all the self-doubt and sudden guessing that used to plague me as I tried to figure out my identity and my place in the world. The truth is that the last 10 years have taught me as much about how to be a good officer as my four years in Annapolis, if not more. When I graduated but did not commission, I thought I had completely failed in living up to the Naval Academy's mission. As any plebe should be able to rattle off upon reporting to plebe, to plebe summer, Sir, the mission of the United States Naval Academy is to develop a ship in morally, mentally, and physically, and to imbue them with the highest ideals of duty, honor, and loyalty in order to graduate leaders who are dedicated to the career of naval service and have potential for future development and mind into character to assume the highest responsibilities of man, citizenship, and government. Sir! Uh, all right, I had to brush up on that one. 
but you know, you might not have caught every word of that, but I'd like to point out that the mission does not say that the academy exists to graduate officers, uh, but to graduate leaders. Leaders who are dedicated to a career of naval service. When I set down this path to fight for my career of naval service, first to obtain an administrative remedy in the form of an exception to policy, and then only after the denial of my request and subsequent discharge, to challenge the policy itself through the court system, uh, I knew the odds were long that I might ever reach this day. But I also knew that I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I did not do everything that was within my control to try to get here, to once again have the opportunity to serve. And I so... <laughs> <laughs> and I so desperately still wanted to be of service in the way that I had first raised my hand for 14 years ago. But at the end of the day, I could live with defeat if that was what awaited at the end of the road. What I knew I couldn't live with was the re regret of not trying. It was in the trying that I knew that no matter what, I could stand tall and proud in the knowledge that I had stayed true to the Naval Academy's mission to graduate in me, a leader who was dedicated to a career of naval service. But, spoiler alert, defeat is not what awaited at the end of the road. In 2022's ruling in Harrison v. Austin, Judge Leonie Brinkema ruled that the Department of Defense's, quote, policy is prohibiting the commissioning and retention of HIV-positive service members who are asymptomatic and have undetectable viral loads are irrational, as well as arbitrary and capricious, end quote. Within three months, the Pentagon updated the policy specific to service academy cadets and midshipmen, meaning future cadets and midshipmen who found themselves with my same diagnosis would not be barred from commissioning. And two years later, we are here today victorious. <laughs> I say we are victorious because again, this took a village and I would like to take some time to acknowledge some village VIPs. And to start with my parents, Bob and Sue. You, you have been by my side not just the past 10 years, but the past 32 years. Uh, you, were, you were ready to fight the Pentagon before I was. <laughs> I practically had to hold y'all back. And uh, you've consistently done your best to keep me focused on the important things. I'm so happy that you finally had the chance to get the recognition you deserve. Uh, stop crying, you guys. <laughs> uh, through pinning on my rank. I want to thank the rest of my family as well especially my original role model, Adam, and my original bestie, Kelsey. Uh, you guys have also been there uh, for me through the highs and lows. Adam, 14 years after you administered the oath to me as a scared little plebe, uh, it means the world to me that we can finally come full circle today. My aunts and cousins who've made it here, uh, thank you for your love and support through the years too. And Sydney, Sebastian, and Nixon, and I'm so glad you could be here, and I love you very much. I, I want to thank my fellow plaintiffs in these cases that have created such change in the way the military treats service members living with HIV. First Lieutenant Nick Harrison, you're the real OG, as I tell anyone and everyone who will listen. You were the first person, at least that I ever saw, uh, who raised your hand and put your name and face out there in ownership of this issue as a named plaintiff. And it was the decision in your case that led to today's celebration. There are a small, uh, it, it, it was an honor for Jake and me to be at your commissioning ceremony, sir in D.C. And there are a small handful of unnamed plaintiffs on a variety of other related cases, and I want to acknowledge them as well. In particular, I want to highlight my co-plaintiff in this case, who had the courage to start this particular legal challenge. I joined the case a few months after it was initially filed, so while it had my name attached to it thereafter, former Air Force Academy cadet John Doe deserves the credit for taking the first step in our case. Speaking of these cases, I have to thank the Rockstar legal team who represented us in this case and is at the center of the others as well. Pro bono representation was provided by Lambda Legal, Winston and Strawn LLP, Perkowski Legal PC, and Scott Chavez. Peter Perkowski, a, a Western New York native, is here in person to represent the team. On behalf of your clients in these cases and all service members living with HIV, thank you for your attention to this issue. It can feel like an issue that is virtually invisible in the context of other hot button issues related to military service, even in the LGBTQ plus context. But you all ensure that it's not invisible and we are not forgotten. Peter, will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. I'd like to give a quick thank you
you to my work chain of command at M&T Bank. I don't take for granted your support of my process taking the next step in my journey. Um, I'm not sure if you knew that this was something I was working on when I first interviewed to join the bank uh, back in 2019. Uh, it didn't come up in the interviews, though it certainly was Googleable, Googleable so I, I don't feel bad about it. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, Chris, Keith, Tracy, and other members of the M&T family who are here, thank you. Your support is something I would continue to lean on uh, as I begin my reserve service. I touched on First Lieutenant Nick Harrison and Commander Adam Habitball, and I want to thank the rest of our official party today. Vice Admiral Kevin Green, I'm very lucky that my mother's cousin Kate met you while you were a midshipman in Annapolis <laughs> and stuck with you through your distinguished, more than three decade long naval career. You've been a source of wisdom, support, and encouragement as I have turned to you over the years for advice in this journey. Thank you. Lieutenant Koya, Lieutenant Kyle Koya, and Chief Samuel Sabrino. You have been the most helpful recruiter duo anyone in my position could have ever hoped for. I am sure my case has to rank highly in your all-time list of unique situations, but you never once made me feel like the extra hassle was not worth it to you. I'm so grateful that after the work you both did to get me to this point, you could be here to participate in today's ceremony in such a meaningful way. Father Vincent, thank you for, your, for blessing today's ceremony with your prayers. I feel very lucky to have found a welcoming Catholic parish here on Buffalo's west side, and it's a joy to sing for the Holy Cross Parish on Sundays. Shout out to the members of the Holy Cross Ladies Society who are uh, here today. Lastly, thank you to an uh, unofficial official party member, my cousin, Navy JAG Lieutenant Commander Molly Altes, for serving as us usher slash bouncer and uh, <laughs> helping everyone find their way here to the fantail of the Little Rock. Everyone, uh, can we please have a round of applause for the Buffalo Game Men's Course under the direction of Dr. <laughs> And it was with the Twin Cities Gay Men's Chorus that I first felt confident and safe enough to come out in a somewhat public way about my HIV status in 2018. It was truly only after the outpouring of love, support, and brotherhood that came from that decision, as well as the example of other out and proud HIV activists and advocates I met in Minnesota, including Alex Palacios, who is here today, that I gained the confidence to be more open about my status to the broader world, starting with a simple Facebook post. A few short months later, I agreed to become the name plaintiff on the lawsuit that put me in the position to arrive at this day. Uh, when I asked Dr. Strauss via email uh, whether he thought some members of the chorus might be willing to perform at the ceremony, he said he was sure they'd be honored to do so, and that he was as well. I wasn't able to make the rehearsal where he brought it up to the chorus membership. I was... Why did I write this? I was, <laughs> I was still wrapping up my brief, but are now already nominated Buffalo Theater. <laughs> He let me know that the idea was received warmly. Weeks later, when I was able to speak to the rest of the course about the journey to this point and ask for confirmation on who might be able to make it to Canal Side at 3 o'clock p.m. Friday Memorial Day weekend, I was moved to tears to see uh, almost every single member stand up. Ladies, gentlemen, and friends beyond binary, this group is the very embodiment of love, support, and brotherhood. And my, life, my life is just one of thousands that have been deeply touched, enhanced, and even saved by the BGMC and groups like it around the world. The BGMC is a pillar of our Buffalo LGBTQ plus community, and I am proud to sing with them. By the way, some of you missed an incredible concert last weekend, but visit thebgmc.org to join our mailing list and stay abreast of future concert dates. <laughs> Thank you to all who donated to the course via the eBright invitation link. Uh, yesterday, we hit our goal of, fun of raising $1,000. So please uh, give yourselves a round of applause. If you want to hear that. And please, please believe me when I say that your generosity helps support a char charitable organization that adds much needed color and light to the beautiful tapestry of our Western New York community. community. Lastly, I want to thank the most special person in my life, my partner, Jacob Pond. To be <laughs> Fair, Jake. I told you about this Navy business on our first date two years ago. Uh, but still, I acknowledge that I am a very difficult person to share a life with. Uh, and I'm sorry for all the stress that my schedule packing tendencies uh, can induce in our lives. You've become my rock during the times when I worry I bit off more than I can chew. 
especially in the last few months as I've been preparing for this next chapter, and you help shoulder much of that burden, as well as help think through the times when perhaps I don't need to say yes to a new thing. <laughs> <laughs> I will always strive to make the extra effort worth it to you. I thank God that you and Henry came into Sailor in my life and yes, I have a puggle, a rescue puggle named Sailor. I did not name him. He's already, he already had that name. Uh, I swear to God. <laughs> but I'm so lucky that you came into our lives and became not just my boyfriend, but my best friend. I'm thankful also that you brought Laura and Gary into my life and that they're just a 20 minute drive away when either of us needs a taste of home. Happy birthday to Gary, by the way. Sorry for upstaging you. <laughs> It took, it took all these individuals and so many more of you present today and with us in spirit to make this happen. Thank you to each of you who took time out of your day to make the ceremony a true celebration of the power of community. All right, I know, I'm sorry this is a lot. Uh, I, I wanna speak finally to what I hope this occasion can teach all of us. For starters, I'd be remiss not to take the opportunity to educate folks on HIV and, and the military. There are a lot of directions I could go here, but I'll emphasize two points. First, undetectable equals untransmittable, or U equals U. When someone living with HIV is adherent to their antiretroviral treatment, the virus doesn't completely go away, but it becomes suppressed in the bloodstream uh, to the point where it cannot be transmitted to others uh, through otherwise common transmission pathways such as sex. This is why it is not just possible, but standard at this point, to have couples like Jake and me, where one partner is negative and the other is positive, and it stays that way. Second, there is an extremely common phrase associated with HIV that I would invite us all to consider leaving behind in 2024. That phrase is, HIV is not a death sentence. I know I heard this well-intentioned phrase uh, when I was told my diagnosis by the commandant of midshipmen uh, on April 1st, 2014, and it was little to no comfort to me then. The fact is that while for the first two decades, of this epidemic, it certainly seemed about as close to a death sentence as one could get. And while it continues to be a serious disease that, let's face it, one would rather not contract, um, in the United States, assuming access to affordable health insurance, it is completely manageable. And the primary difficulty in living with HIV lies in the stigma that continues to surround the virus. A stigma which, let's face it, in comparison to a death sentence does little to abate. So, if you are ever faced with a situation where you may be tempted to say, well, you know, HIV is not a death sentence anymore, I hope you'll instead say something like, HIV has no bearing on someone's worth as a human, or HIV won't stop you from finding love, or HIV can't stop you from achieving your dreams, even if your dreams include serving as an officer in the Navy. I hope that today can offer some insight into who we are as humans, regardless of HIV status. Over the course of the public phase of this push for policy change and the chance to serve over the last six years, there have been a few times when people have expressed admiration for my choice to fight, including Naval Academy classmates of mine, as if they know that they themselves would not have made the same exact choices had they been in my situation, of having first made an oath to serve in this way, gone through four years of training at a place whose mission is to graduate leaders who are dedicated to, say with me, dedicated to a career of naval service, and then been told that they were no longer qualified to serve when they knew damn well they were fully qualified. I strongly disagree with the notion that the choices I have made to continue my fight would not have been made by the vast majority of my 2014 Naval Academy classmates had they been in my shoes. We all had instilled in us things like the Naval Academy Honor Concept, which states, midshipmen are persons of integrity. They stand for that which is right. During Pleak Summer, we all had to commit to memory an excerpt of the famous speech, Man in the Arena, by Theodore Roosevelt, someone else who notably had a commissioning of sorts here in Buffalo. Uh, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. We all learned the story of 2004 Naval Academy graduate Travis Manning, a Marine killed in action in 2007 during Operation Iraqi Freedom, whose mantra, if not me, then who, 
has been a guiding light during tough decisions for many of us. All of my classmates have strived to live up to the standard of the Naval Academy and the Navy and Marine Corps, and the vast majority of them have risked far more than I in doing so. So what I take away from this is something I believe to be a fund fundamental truth, which is that we all don't give ourselves nearly enough credit for how brave and generous we naturally are as humans. Think about the links that each of you have gone in your lives to care for the people you love or to defend them. I believe most of us crave ways to positively impact the world around us and be of service to others. That may not look like military service to many or most people, but it, it manifests itself in taking care of our families, volunteering in our communities, engaging in local politics, simply being one good neighbor in a city of good neighbors. The way we view others can often be a reflection of how we view ourselves. So if you look at my story and think it is uplifting or inspirational, I ask that you look inward at all the ways you, in turn, uplift and inspire those around you every day. The power to positively impact the world around us is in each of us. And I believe that almost to a person, one of our deepest desires as humans is to lean into that potential and make a difference. Well, I think I've been speaking now for an additional 10 years, so I will <laughs> go ahead and wrap up before I hit 20 and I'm eligible for retirement. Um, I started this speech with the quirky late commissioning coincidence uh, between me and this ship, the USS Little Rock, and I'm going to end it with a few more coincidences. I told you that the, the Little Rock was commissioned on June 17, 1945, too late to make an impact in World War II. For the next four years, she conducted mostly training operations, but was retired and became part of the Atlantic Reserve Fleet in 1949. Later, she was converted to a Galveston-class guided missile cruiser, see the missiles, <laughs> and <laughs> recommissioned in 1960 to serve in the Mediterranean as the Sixth Fleet flagship. Today, she is the last surviving ship from that original Cleveland class of light cruisers. Like me, the Little Rock was originally designated for one purpose, went through four years of training and experienced a bit of a failure to launch, and then took a decade to think through her life and how she might yet answer the call to serve. And she ended up serving as a flagship, no less. Her story of resilience, adaptability, and commitment to service is one that I will take with me as I begin this new chapter. I will do my best to follow her lead, bring every last drop of positive impact out of this second chance of service, and be an example for others of the transformative power of service to a cause greater than oneself. And I know I will not be alone in this, because this village will be with me just as you have been all along. So thank you for making this day so special, and I'm sorry for the long speech.
May God hold you in the palm of his hand. We ask this in God's name. Amen. Anchors away, my boys. Anchors away. Farewell to college joys. We sail at break of day. To our last night on shore. Drink to the home. Until we meet once more. Here's wishing you a happy. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony. Staff will now clear the chairs from the deck. Please stay for a reception with and refreshments provided by the Buffalo Catering Company.